best car you've reviewed? Oh my god, I'm driving the Chiron Super Sport 300. I want to do over 200 miles an hour. Whoa! Whoa! Today we are joined by Matt Watson. What's the most controversial subjective part that you've added? Oh, Mazda will not lend me Mazdas. Why? Because I said the Mazda 3 looked like a cat having a poo and showed a picture of a <laughs> cat having a poo off the website. And it was the same colour as the car. People say that about my car. What is it? <laughs> it's that Lamborghini Urus outside. Yeah, that just looks poo. <laughs> what is your dream three car garage? Mm. So if I've got an, an R <laughs> then I've got a G <laughs> So I'd have a Tesla Model 3. Not a, cla not, not a classic is car? Anybody you expect? No. <laughs> Hi guys and welcome to episode 12 of the GVE podcast and today we are joined by Matt Watson. Thanks for being here today. Uh, Chief Content Co uh, Officer at CarWow, nearly 1 million, sorry, more than 1 million subscribers <laughs> on Instagram, 1 million <laughs> subscribers on uh, YouTube and over 700,000 followers on TikTok. And you've overseen uh, the YouTube uh, channel for CarWow's growth to over 8 million subscribers. That's pretty damn impressive, man. Yeah, yeah, cool. And we also had like a record breaking month um, in August. We had 77 million views. 77 um, million views in, August. in one yeah. month. I that's mean, if you're talking Mr. Beast, that's like three days of a video, right? <laughs> but for car content, it's pretty good. That is unbelievable. That's YouTube solely. Yeah, so I think that's the most of any channel in a month apart from Supercar Blondie, but her numbers are actually made up mainly from shorts. Ours is more long form. Most, uh, auto, uh, sorry, the most in any automotive channel. Yeah, on YouTube globally. Wow. But second to Supercar Blondie, but like I say, she does lots of shorts. It's slightly different content strategy. Okay. Well, let's get back onto social media in a bit, but let's let's start with um, Matt Watson, early days. So not many people must know this, but you used to be an accountant. I used to be an accountant. That's right. And you used to be an accountant. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we kind of... Followed a slightly similar path. So, yeah. yeah, I at university, I did a chemistry degree. Yeah. And then, I don't know if it was like this for you. The natural degree before you become an accountant. Well, right? It's any degree yeah. before you become an accountant. <laughs> but the, the accountancy firms are pretty savvy. They come around early doors and they groom you. And they basically offer you a job or, or get it all done and dusted nice and early in your final year. So you think, oh, I've got a job there. I'll concentrate on my finals and I'll probably look for another job because I don't want to be an accountant. Yeah. Next thing you know, you do your finals. You haven't looked for another job. It's like September and it's like, all right, and I better do I'll this for a it. bit. <laughs> I'll, I'll take, take it. it. Well, funnily enough, um, they didn't groom me. Uh, I, I applied to 40 different investment banks and asset managers and this and the other. Got rejected by every single one. And uh -huh. then the last one was KPMG and they managed to take me. So I was uh, similar. I didn't go for investment banks. I had no idea back in the day. You know, I just did accountancy. And I applied to the accountancy firm that hired you and they rejected me. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and and I got rejected by PwC. And, so. Which was the one that I was at, which rejected you. So it's kind of like, it's really, what are the criteria? I don't know. But yeah, so but, I did that. And uh, you quite enjoyed it? No. Please. I enjoyed parts of it. Uh -huh. So basically, as you come out of university, um, because I did a chemistry degree, it was a full-time job doing a chemistry degree. My fellow mate did history and he was there like for two hours a week. Completely different. Yeah. So I saw... And by the way, what uni did you go to? I went to Edinburgh. Edinburgh, okay, cool. I saw going to do accountancy, a bit like an extension from university, because half of the time you spent studying, you get, you join in a sort of intake. So there's people your own age coming out of university, so you, there's like a class of you of about 30. And you'll know it's like that. And then you've got like that kind of student element with the bonding and people are like-minded people. Yeah, you're all in it together, right? You're all in it together. Yeah. You're still studying a bit, but you've got some money, not anywhere near like the money I thought I'd get. Yeah. When they told me my- 25 grand. What was mine? Mine was less than that. I think it was 18. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, no, no, sorry, 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 I beg your pardon. Yeah, it was around 20 grand at the start, yeah. Because I thought it yeah. would like start off like, you know, like 25, 30, but then I was told at 18, and I'm sure my face just dropped <laughs> like, in the <laughs> interview. How am I going to survive on that? <laughs> so, yeah. what? But it's better than nothing at uni, right? Yeah, so what, you know, you had money to go and drink, basically. Yeah. Um, which was still in fashion when I was doing yeah. uh, my accountancy exams. But yeah, so did that, qualified. Yeah. 
um, that the exams were much tougher than chemistry. Mm. You, you, the, the toughest exams I've ever done. I did so many. When you're practicing going through. Just you, nuts. You do so many exams. And did you fail any? So I it's, it's kind of didn't quite pass. It's weird because when I did it, they called it a referral. The the one which was actually accountancy, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I didn't pass that for the final, but I retook it and then qualified. Oh, man. I remember I I failed one as well. It's the same. Uh, financial financial accounting, yeah. Oh, my God. And and they basically said to me, you fail another one, you're out. Yeah. So there's, there's that pressure and you spend that time. Yeah. But once I got my qualification, handed in my notice straight no away. No way, straight away. A, a week or so. That is brilliant. <laughs> Did you? Um, okay, I'll tell you what happened with mine. I I was, I thought, okay, look, I'm on the trajectory. I'm, I'm going in the right direction now. I know what I want. And that feeling of passing those exams, right? And I don't think, unless you've actually done it, I think the only other people that can relate to this kind of feeling are like your doctors or something like that when they've just, or your lawyers that just suddenly passed their bar exam or something, right? But, uh, you know, I thought my life was set once I passed that exam uh -huh. and I'm going to become this hotshot investment banker. And then I started, uh, I was working in M&A, um, due diligence, and then suddenly I turn up to work one day after leaving the office at 11 o'clock at night and travelling an hour and a half into Canary Wharf. And then I got in five minutes late and somebody threw his papers at me and said, I shouldn't be doing this shit. It should be your job. Right? <laughs> Just because I was five minutes late. So I was like, and that was say about six months after I passed. I was like, I'm never, uh -huh. ever coming back to this place again. I am done. Yeah. But and then what What was, was there any specific moment for you that said, okay, accountancy is not right for me anymore. I want to go into journalism, right? Yeah, so what I actually, I knew it wasn't right for me just because of my mentality. So I was on a late night consolidation audit. So it was for a, a group of companies, it was a PLC, and you're getting all their different companies and you're putting all their accounts together to make sure it's all accurate, yeah, yeah. the final reporting accounts. And you, like you say, working stupid hours in a room, yeah. like with loads of files, checking stuff in different coloured pen. And I remember once playing hide and seek with my mate and the FD of this company had gone home but he'd forgotten something. And he came to his office, opened up his cupboard, and I, and I came out of his cupboard because I was hiding in his cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> and I got away. He was quite a cool guy. I got away with it because as he opened it, I just stepped out and coolly said to him, we leave no stone unturned. <laughs> <laughs> and I just walked off back to the audit room and I sort of got away with it because he found it funny. But I knew that I was not part of the material. So there was not going to be decent money in it for me and the key thing though i wasn't so motivated by money one of the people that i worked with his wife was the editor of a local evening newspaper mm. and all of us would bitch about our jobs oh god it's so boring oh, I hate it. well you got to work to earn money she talked about her job like it was her passion mm. and i thought do you know what Journalism is a bit like county because you have to ask people questions about mm. wh where's this balance from, blah, blah. And she was the only person in my life I'd met who talked passionately about her job. And so I, I did journalism exams and got a job on a local evening newspaper. And I did that for a year. But I was always, since I was a kid, into cars. And a job came up on a magazine called Auto Express. Yeah, I remember. In the consumer section. So then I applied to that. And when I combined my um, like business knowledge with the journalist skills, you know, I got the job because I the job was to like investigate work with members of the public who had problems with their dealer, who you like this actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, if they had a problem with their car, and it was all based around consumer rights and sell and supply goods act. Oh my god! And so I was involved. So you were giving our customers advice on how to not you stitch us up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not not necessarily. Main dealers, basically, I, w I would get people new cars. Oh, wow. People who are trying to reject their cars because it's not a satisfactory quality or the service, blah, 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 blah. And I'd work with the manufacturer to push the dealer to get a new car. Ah. So that's what I did. I bet the manufacturers loved you, eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which made it hard when I switched the, later on to the job of reviewing cars, but yes. that came much later on. Yeah. Well, I think... Actually, my next question was, what made you get into cars? So you're a car nut. You said that you've always been interested in cars. Like, 
How did that come about? So I've always liked cars. I haven't necessarily been the... There would have been people who worked on the magazine who were bigger car nuts than me, who, you know, went with their father or whatever to the races or went, like, car shows with the... I, I, had, I was above average interest, and I liked to do a bit of work on my cars myself. And I was into cars, but there were other journalists who were more geeky into cars. And one of my friends was more into cars than me. And mm. I'm effectively, hello, Greg, living his best life. Because mm. <laughs> he knew more than me, but I was into them, but not insanely in a geeky way, which you will find if you talk to people who um, worked on magazines. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many like influencers now in the car, supercar space, especially, right? And you get all differing levels of knowledge in and amongst these influencers. So you get one which would just be like, look at the sound on this car. Yeah. All right. And then you'll get on the total opposite end, I guess, what, somebody like Shmi? Who's because very, yeah, he knows a lot about his cars. And yeah. He's, yeah, he's on it. He's on it. Down for last space. He knows the name of every single colour of all key car manufacturers. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, high, supercar, hypercar manufacturers, he knows the name of the colours. So wh where would you say that you're on that spe spectrum? So I, when I started, I wasn't that into the, that spectrum. Now I'm well in it. In, but you? mine's more from a consumer point of view because I test, basically today, I've come. Guess what car I've come in today? It's brand new. Um, have a quick look outside just Hyundai. very quickly it's look outside and see if you can spot my car is it the iconic Hyundai thing is it is the G-Wagon Brabus um, <laughs> it's the new Honda CRV oh because okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reviewing that tomorrow alongside what else am I doing a GLE uh, plug-in hybrid oh nice so I'll do stuff like that mm. which is like the consumer advice side normal reviews yeah but also, I'll be drag racing a Rimac Nevera against wow. a Formula One car. <laughs> so so cool. the, the interesting thing with your content is, like we were saying, within this industry where you've got the likes of Shmi, who know everything about models, and then you've got the likes of other influencers who talk about just the model alone and just, just try and give an insight to people about these cars. How do you, like, your content's quite particular to, would you say the younger market or people who aren't so into cars? It's in some ways it's mixed. It's a bit odd. So originally for CarWow, the strategy was to create um, videos for people going on the site mm. while researching which car to buy because we were like a lead, effectively a lead generation site. Exactly, we were yeah. back then. Um, and so you're producing uh, consumer videos to help them with that. And we put them on YouTube because also it acts as a marketing tool when people are searching. YouTube is the second biggest search engine. Mm that it allows us to promote our business. Because essentially the Carway YouTube channel is one big load of sponsored content. However, it's not like sponsored content for any brand mm. because we're completely like open and honest yeah. and quite brutal, more brutal than the likes of what you'd consider normal consumer magazines or titles or channels. Top Gear and stuff. So we'll probably be more brutal than Top Gear is... You th might be thinking about the TV show, which is a little bit more brutal, mm. but compared to the magazine, I'd say, yeah. Yeah. And quite say things that some manufacturers would be like, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Have you had any manufacturers? Yes. Like yes. <laughs> I don't want to go, <laughs> to go to, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> had quite, a, you know, ruffled a few feathers. But one of the things about it is that it makes you're authentic and people trust it. The algorithm picks that up and it promotes you. Mm. But as part of the strategy um, to really like, try and like capitalize on like the marketability of having a youtube channel with reach was to do these drag races every like who came up with that idea do you want to know no. why i came up with that idea <laughs> so when i was in the mag uh, on the magazine the key thing was that journalists would like to do track battles hmm. so you'd show how quick a car is around a track compared to another now yeah. to do that you need to be really really consistent you need a racing driver and like some of the thing like the Stig, but some of the magazines had people that were almost racing drivers standard really? or as good as, you know, club okay. racing. Got so it. they can put in consistent laps. Yes. Now I can do that. I, I can go around pretty quick, mm. but I can't do that consistency. And so I thought another way is drag racing because it's easier to do. Yeah. Now, the reason drag racing is successful is because it's more relatable. Anyone can do it. It answers the question of which car is quicker in a straight line, which ultimately yeah. most people, most normal people, other than real hardcore 
car geeks mm. want to know which is the fastest. Yeah. Yeah. And even people with supercars, right? Most of the time, that's all they can really do. If you're yeah. at the traffic lights with somebody and you're going to put your foot down, you're not going to say, yeah. I'll race you down to the pub or something yeah. like that. Right? It's just rarely find yeah. people with supercars you'd want to track them. I mean, very rarely one of our customers is ever buying a car for the track. So straight line speed is essentially how you get to drive them in the UK. It is. Yeah. And it's not just that. It's also, it provides quite a good spectacle when you're just watching it on YouTube. You've got the cars lined up. Uh, and are very specific in the way that we film them. Mm. And the, it, it's it's a very fair representation, and I always make sure that it's fair. There's this whole thing about Matt winning. It, it <laughs> goes always in the winning car. Ask Yanni that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But people think that. But what happens is I tend to go in the newest car mm. just because it has the interest around it, so I need to explain it, and because I'm the host, that's kind of why we do that. And often, when a new car comes out, it's benchmarked against its competitors, <laughs> when when you get these cars given to you so some of the manufacturers would say i mean do they turn around and say matt we've just released the latest conic seg jesco whatever are you okay to test drive it for us or or do a review and maybe or do, do you a drag race them? no okay so conic seg i've never driven a conic seg apart oh, sorry i've drag raced one but that was from an owner mm. um porsche they'll call us up and go here's a new car do you want to come on the launch test it I've, you know the mainstream manufacturers will invite us to an event to test drive the car and you might go, you know, I'll fly all around the world doing this stuff. But it's not just, you get really wealthy owners as well saying, do you want to come up to my country? And That's so cool. Race like, have you started street. doing that yet? Yeah. Uh, drag races in different countries? Yeah, so we did one in, I think it was Abu Dhabi, but it was from base out of Dubai. I think okay. we'd filmed it in Abu Dhabi because it's just across the border, uh -huh. I think. Um, yeah, where we drove some pretty special things. Um, yeah. so that's, And like, that that's pretty crazy that you're getting now an international audience. It's not just the UK. Oh, it's, it's uh, so international. Really? It is an international audience. You, I was in Qatar the other day and really? like, at the Qatar Geneva Motor Show because they like branded it Geneva because... <laughs> that makes sense it does actually I'll tell you why it makes sense right because it does seem to say, what's going on basically if you have the Qatar Motor Show people are like what yeah. whereas Geneva Motor Show is a brand yes. and so it's like we've taken we'd take the know-how there there's this brand and we we're putting it down yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit like with the World Cup is a brand Yeah, and so they put it into yeah. Qatar anyway so yeah Loads of people like selfie in. I just came into your place and a guy from Canada did a selfie with me. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was, That's so cool. Yeah, you get that, you know, I have like pilots like on plane will come out there like cabin and go, oh yeah, I heard that you're on. Um, so I bought this car. Was the right <laughs> choice? Yeah. What's, what's the craziest request you've been um, given in terms of drag racing a car? How do you mean? Like people asking for us to do it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come down to my country. Ah, uh, okay. So there's some things coming up. So I don't want to go into too much detail. But it was a couple of years ago when I thought, wow, this is special. When Red Bull contacted us and go, uh, would you like to race a Formula One car? <laughs> and that was just like, okay. Yeah. That's insane. So they contacted you. They, they reached out to you. Yeah. Wow. So you've done this or is yet to come? No, it's happened. We've done like... Done a couple we did a couple oh, of years ago. Couple. We did um, okay. a video that blew it. So I think it's done twenty five mil. So of course, yes, uh, Formula yes. One car versus a Chiron. More recently, we and you got you got to drive the the Formula One. No, car. Oh. no. So they, they weren't. They no, weren't. but when we do our drag races, I like to make sure that the cars perform at the best that they possibly can. Otherwise, what's the point? Really. Um, and so I would never be able to get a Formula One car off the line to do any justice. Mm. So you do need a professional racing driver to do that. Mm. The first time was Coulthard. Wow. And the second time was Liam Lawson, who's racing for Alpha Touri at the moment. Cool. Yeah, talking about making sure cars uh, uh, race at their optimal performance. We gave you a Bugatti, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that was optimal. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, it was a car that was sat in the showroom for, for a year, not used. And then the first time it was used was for a drag race. But you, How did that um, go, Matt? Yeah. <laughs> that, that didn't go well. It's a real shame, actually, because we wanted to see how it could go. And, and it kind of looked like it would do it, but then it played up. But you guys have rectified the problem, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think we knew what it was when it came back to us. And um, 
the funny story at the time was there was an it was an owner who had that car with us and we sold the car to him and he was completely aware it was going into um car wow drag race video and he was completely up for it so we did all the checks but as soon as that happened and he saw that the car sort of halted halfway down the drag strip he made it his mission to sell the car and he's like whatever happens is that he, he bought really? it from us yeah and he never drove the damn thing and so he just bought it as an investment thought okay i'll just park it down here uh -huh. you guys keep it for me and then i'll sell it later uh or he, would he want never it to take it. yeah he never took it out once he was going to take it to a, a road trip to monaco yeah but I think, it. yeah, couldn't do it. And so it sat in the showroom for the best part of two years, not driven at all, just sat there. And then, um, yeah, after a couple of drives, it was taken to the drag strip. So, um, I mean, you prepped it though, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, you yeah. You didn't just, it wasn't like first. To <laughs> to, <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're up. Off you go. <laughs> and he was probably warmed up and everything on the day, but yeah, but it was a bit of a shame. And he'd done some runs before, right? Before you guys actually... Done yeah, he did a run. I think he before you got, but he he did a run on that um, with a test driver who was going to be driving it, and he's like, he found it awesome. Yeah. But what was really interesting about that was the effect that Carwow or Carwow's YouTube has on the consumer is incredible. This is a guy who's got a car that's worth just short of a million pounds, who is ready to take trade bids. So he's, in essence, ready to lose the best part of three or four hundred grand just because of a video going to uh, being released on YouTube. Mm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> do you feel the effects of that? With that, that you have that big of a reach. So, you, so if you think about that, three or four hundred grand. If you look at a car manufacturer that invests billions in a car, the development of a car, then you have someone who can like, say something and actually affect sales. It's nuts, it's, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You sometimes feel bad when you go to an event and you've like criticized a car or something, and the mm. person's there, like the, the design, and you've like kind of criticized <laughs> their fake exhaust pipes. In, <laughs> is in that a after he's been made redundant? Way. Sorry, is that after he's been made redundant <laughs> 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 because of your video? <laughs> but uh, you know, and there is a bit of responsibility that when I'm when I'm doing the reviews, I'm trying to be really objective for the consumer and be fair on the manufacturer and judge the car. Um, as to against what it's supposed to be and its key competitors, but also trying to do it in a way that's fun, yeah. and do it in a way that I mean the idea is is that I'm not like this kind of like dry like here's the facts of or, as, here's my um, review of this car. I'm supposed to, I do it like I'm your friend and we're having a bit of a laugh. Like yeah. you talk to you know I'm basically the car expert mate uh, amongst my my friendship circle. They'll ask me about stuff, mm. and that's basically what I'm doing on YouTube with the reviews. It's just to a wider audience. Mm. Well, you're the first sort of videos that say people what I've watched. You're like if when I want to go buy a car, I'll watch your videos and see what you say about it. And a lot of my friends that watch Car Wow and your videos are exactly the same. Like you know before they bought the car, oh, what did Matt Watson say about it? You know, and that's quite you've sort of reach into that quite well you know that's kind of your success of those videos is but based on that you know a bit of a and yeah you know space. i think a lot of people always sort of go to your reviews as as a point of uh, of contact before making a decision on a car so you've got so, an example of that yeah so when i bought my r8 i, I reviewed your your review on it and uh i know you said all the good things about it and you sort of mentioned about the the sitting position about being six foot tall i'm sitting there going oh my god i'm this i'm this how am i going to get it and i sort of when i jumped in it i'm like yep this is exactly what matt said and then um yeah i've somehow I just dealt with it. I've become, you know, comfortable in it. But like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some drive like this. Back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we have the spider. You should try the spider. Yeah, yeah. No, I do have the spider. It is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that comes forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no, so but it is. now that you know your content has this reach and so many people sort of listen to it and it affects the market, have you had manufacturers approach you to say, even tempt you with a uh, with an envelope on the side saying, "Do you mind giving this a good review?" No, they don't do that. And I wouldn't do it anyway. They, no, it's not. It's not like that in in this country and and with the major car manufacturers. Yeah. What they, do, I mean, when don't get me wrong. When you're a journalist, they fly you to a nice location. Um, and there is a, an argument that, you know, I don't. I'm not just given the car and then I review it on a cold day. I mean, I do in the UK, but the launches, they like to show their car in the best location. So they'll they'll make sure that you're out. The roads are good. It's in a sunny environment so that when you're doing video and stuff, it looks nice. You stay, you're not staying at a travel lodge. You're staying at a nice hotel. <laughs> so that, you know, but we don't really get to experience them because you're too busy blooming filming. Mm. Filming just takes forever. Um, and, you know, they do that. Now, they're not doing that because they like us. There must be some benefit. However, because they all do it, 
it's kind of doesn't sway one way or the other. Mm. And and anyway, who treats you the best out of the manufacturers? They don't really. It's not who treats us the best. It's more that who are the more supportive of getting us cars mm. or helping us out with our content requests. I don't. Must be Porsche by what you said before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I I would rather, in some ways, not go to a foreign country because I have to. I mean, mm. you've got to leave here. You said I've got to be. I've got to be off hard stop at this time because I've got to do my thing for my son. <laughs> now I'm going around the world. My daughter's two. Just over two. I'm, it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. I would rather do it all from where I live. Mm. So Initially, it's all glamorous and what. In, initially, until yeah. you've got a family, then it's not. <laughs> uh, and our, there's certain things that we're doing because we know the content that's coming up, which is pretty big, which I've got to go to the States, I've got to go to the Middle East again. Wow. Um, but I'm there grafting. And, it, and it, it is exciting and we're doing it because of the content rather than I'm going to go to X, Y, and Z place because you don't get a chance to really see it because you, you, you're working and you, what you miss out is seeing your family. Your family. But, my God, coming from something like accountancy yeah. where I used to drive to work considering driving into oncoming traffic because <laughs> it was so awful. <laughs> you know, it's... I don't have a Sunday. My Sunday is not, oh, I'm at work on Monday. Yeah. It's more like, oh, am I going to fit it all in? Yeah. It's not about, ugh. Yeah. I, it, it, when work doesn't feel like work anymore, then you know that you're doing something right, right? But then it takes over your life. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. How, how long do you typically spend reviewing a car? Well, it depends. So this one I have got, um, it came to me on Friday, but I've taken it, I brought it down last night to London, driven it back. I'll have a mooch around it. So I'll spend some time. Um, on it and then I'll film it it'll probably take half a day to film the review on that car but I've got some knowledge from it and I've got a team that find out like bullet point facts for mm. me mm. so it's not scripted but they'll give me like all the facts that I can say like engine capacity um, price exactly Horsepower all that kind of stuff mm. space. Um, all that kind of things how it compares like into objectively rather than subjectively where, uh, whereas I add the subjective to it mm. And like, what? what's the most controversial subjective part that you've added? Oh, there's been things something about uh, it, color on a car or something. No, there's no. certain things that ugh, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> so, I Mazda will not lend me Mazdas. Why? Because I said the Mazda 3 looked like a cat having a poo and showed a picture of a <laughs> cat having a poo off the website, and it was the same color as the car. Um, and but so people say that about my car. What is it? <laughs> it's that Lamborghini Urus outside. Yeah, that just looks poo. <laughs> <laughs> what? In fact, you my daughter didn't like poo it. that colour. No, I like it. Can we have a hard stop right now, it was, please? It was, a, it was the first poo in the potty and it was the same colour as your car. <laughs> <laughs> I can send you a picture of that. <laughs> so on the subject where, of cars. Where did we go from here? Yeah. All of a sudden, they don't like you very much. No, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's what happens. Anyway, on the subject of cars, though, you do have a few and you've got a nice one coming very soon, I hear. Yeah, so I've got, a few, I've got I think I've got 10 or 11 but most of them are rubbish things from the noughties. No way. 10 or 11 cars. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm from Warsaw, yeah. which means I like a bargain, do I? Mm. And um, so I've like, if I list my cars out, they're pretty, they're not, <laughs> you won't want them. So a 911 996, which is oh, like yeah. the cheapest 911, but it's I've done loads car. to it and it's good yeah. fun to drive. Yeah. So I think that cost me 16 grand. Wow. I bought, I just bought a KN, <laughs> KN Turbo. Okay. Okay. Why are we covering your mouth? Because I haven't revealed the video. I said that. <laughs> 2007. <laughs> yeah. I bought a Boxer 986, which had one that owner was garage. So it's like new. That wasn't very expensive. It was six grand. Okay. I've got a Fiat 126. I've got a supercharged Mazda MX-5. I've got a Suzuki Jimny, the current shape. I've got a GR Yaris. I've got a BMW X5, which I came in last time, which is a two grand car. Wow. Well, you had to open the door from the inside. Yeah, fix that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got, I think I've got some other things, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And I've got a GT, the new GT3 RS. <laughs> that's what you're after, isn't that's it? That's what I was waiting for. I was like, come last. on, let's get to the Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got a GT3 RS, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Is that because of your relationship with Porsche? Okay, so a lot of people, I don't really want to go too into it, but... I did a, a video of me specking a GT3 RS on my own channel, and it's in 3.7 million views. Oh, wow. They'd be mad not to, right? 
Yeah. You know, it's what I like to think about is everything's like a value exchange. Mm. Uh, you know, so the benefit to me is I've got get access to this car. Benefit to them is um, it's a no brainer. It's an absolute no brainer. I mean, sometimes they do make people jump through a lot of hoops yeah. in order to get them right. So I, you buy these fifteen cars off us, and then suddenly you'll get a GT3 RS. And uh, that's a value exchange because you're exchanging exactly. There's value exchange. So, you as a customer exchanging value, and they're yeah. exchanging value allocation on a car. Exactly. So this is your first brand new Porsche you've bought, and your first brand new Porsche is a GT3 RS. But <laughs> jump straight yeah. to the top. They're, they're, they're going to get what God knows how many millions, probably like over twenty million views with all of your content amalgamated together. Yeah, right? I, so I mean, it's up to them, right? It's up to them how they do their business, isn't it? So, Ferrari's been quite known to be quite hard to deal with in terms of giving up cars and stuff. How, how do you find Ferrari? Ferrari um, don't provide us with cars because they don't like drag races. Yeah, really. Yeah, so because they'll lose. So <laughs> no, that we we still drag race their cars because customers watch our watch okay our, so our, our get, content. Yeah, so they'll yeah. just no, they don't necessarily lose. The, there is when you deal with Ferrari, it's quite different to dealing with Porsche. Generally, with Porsche, they go, "Here's a car." Yeah, Meh. there you go. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> uh, it'll do what it does. Yeah. Ferrari, when they're like involved, my experience on magazines, you have, you have support, really? with tires, bit of ECU action. Yeah. Checking everything's running. Send a team out with it, don't they? Yeah, and that's it. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. So they they go over the top with their support. Yeah, so. yeah. So you have as if you're about to do a race and uh, yeah. In their so it's yeah. my experience would be what you get with the Porsche is what you get as a customer. Ah, uh, got it. It's uh, a more although real I can't say that I don't know. I don't actually know what a Ferrari customer has, but I wouldn't imagine. That when you're on a track day, mm. <laughs> you send, have that. <laughs> sending a support staff of like yeah. 20 Maybe people. you can if you pay for it. Yeah. And, and you know, that's up to them. You're there having their car in the media. It's going to be reported on. Yeah. But it's it's a different approach to, approach to Porsche. Wow. Now, other manufacturers do it as well. They're a bit more... But is that an Italian thing or is that... Uh, so, do Lambo... So, Lamborghini... Exactly? Once again, Lamborghini is bizarre with Lamborghini. They don't lend us cars either. We get them from owners. Okay, so um, sounding a bit like a Italian thing. I don't it? know. Yeah, I don't know. It's I. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. It's really quite odd because mm. they're part of the same group as Porsche. Yeah, <laughs> and like you know Bugatti. So I've like Bugatti invited me to drive the Super Sport um, 300 plus when that was unveiled. That's so not cool. unveiled when they first allowed journalists to drive it. Yeah. Oh, and um, uh, actually, that leads me to my next question. What is the best car re review, hands down, that you've ever done? Best car review or best car uh, I've reviewed? Yeah, best car you've reviewed. <sighs> there have been certain like ones that have blown me away, but it can range from things like, oh, my God, I'm driving the Chiron Supersport 300 plus. Like, what was really that like? Limited edition one on the Autobahn, hammering it. Awesome, bit nerve-wracking. Uh. Um but awesome for two reasons driving the car and feeling it but awesome knowing i'm be going to be able to tell the story about it as well um you know but is that something i mean i get this might sound like a stupid question but driving something like that it does it is it a little bit depressing because you know that you never I mean like i've just driven the pinnacle of driving now no because there's always something different in you and i can i can get pleasure from driving i've got a fiat 126 yeah right it it I can appreciate a car for what it is. What it, I, I was filming with a Citroen Ami buggy, which is a limited edition <laughs> version of the Ami. You like limited edition cars. <laughs> Ten grand. But you can't buy them because they're all sold out. <laughs> they wouldn't give me an allocation. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't ask. But they're all sold out. So I was driving this little thing and I was filming it on my property. I was filming it around where I live. And it was good fun filming. And I enjoyed the car. Mm. And I enjoyed the video. And so I can get like pleasure from telling the story and appreciating the car for what it is rather than just being so like, oh, I've just got to drive the fastest things. Mm. It, it, it depends on the car. It's also bang for your buck as well. You know, the Bugatti is 3 million plus, where like a Yaris GR is 30 yeah. and you get a lot of, like the Yaris is a great fun car to drive, you know? It's so a great, It's a great thing of what it does, yeah. Yeah. By the yeah. way, would you recommend, I mean like, 
I've always thought I'd love to get a Yaris GR. Okay, so... you recommend it? I, there's a couple of things about the GR Yaris. It's a kind of car that likes to be on it. Mm. So for general driving, if you're just It'd having it like in town and stuff like that, yeah. forget about it. Really? It's quite noisy. The suspension's reasonably full. It's not terrible. Yeah. It's not the most practical, even though it's a hatchback. You know, it's three door. It's got a small boot. It's quite cramped in the back. Mm. But if you're into cars, mm. like I am, I love the fact that it's a bespoke... Um, it's a sort of a bespoke chassis because it's half Yaris, half um, Corolla at the back. Mm -hmm. It's got the independent suspension. It's got a four-wheel drive system that was created for it. Mm -hmm. It has an engine in it that was created for it. I know it's been used in the GR Corolla now. It's got a bespoke body. It's got a carbon fibre roof. And this was a car that was £33,000. If Mercedes did something that bespoke... It, like the eight made Six the A forty five that bespoke it'd be eighty grand. Mm. Yeah, and I think what happened was Toyota's kind of company that says um, you know we will never sell a car at a loss. Mm. Um, I think a lot of development costs was probably put through their racing team, ah, okay. uh, or there was no marketing apply. I don't know what <laughs> it is, but there's no way it's so bespoke yeah. Yeah. that it's such a unique car. So someone who likes cars and. Yeah. <sighs> I like it as a thing and to drive it is a nutty little thing and mm. point to point over a really kind of twisty back road it's probably about as quick as you can go. Go, yeah. But the problem with it is it's the kind of car that makes you want to get on it. Yeah. And, and you've seen some cars that have flipped over and stuff. Yeah, like and it's short wheel base and it's the kind of thing that it's it's all very good. And how does it do that right up into the point that it's not doing it anymore? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's funny that um what sparked my interest was that we we're seeing these guys like with 812s and F12s and they've all, all of gone. that and they've all got one one of these on the side. Mm. Just thinking there must be something that they know that we don't, but yeah, we yeah. know it's bloody Where are you going to drive it in London? If I was to get one, no. Around, around here, Buckinghamshire and stuff. Like okay, that. so it's quite good for those little roads, but you've got to. It it does. It's a car that makes you wanna. Yeah. You got you out for yeah. a blast in it, kind of thing. Yeah. And it's not one like, like the GT3 RS is quite. A, it's you know it's hardcore. It's a track car, but in some ways because it's rear wheel drive, and you can sort of feel what it's doing, and you can also get a sense of occasion from the engine, just the noise and switching the gears with that kind of with the vice app pack you've got the magnetically actuated click mm. so you get like a little thrill from just that engine like dancing around with the engine even if you're not going that quick getting out and looking at it with the wing and stuff like that even though you're not using the downforce mm. the you know you've got this posh cabin and it's you know racing hard that you can get like thrills from it just driving it normally like normally. people get why have that when it's not on track but this wow. you know you can get out of it and for me, I'd, I'm not into art, but cars are my art, which is why I mean, I'm that is a work of art, and, and it's a work of art. Yeah, it really is. And and the Yaris isn't so much like that. It's it's about <laughs> let's see what I can go down. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's about whoa, I'm going to drive down there pretty quick. Yeah. Okay, your car's perfect three car garage. Obviously, you're getting the GT3 RS. What is your dream three car garage? Okay. So I don't think I need a hyper car. So the GT3 RS would be my like wow car. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably I'll have some form of family car, quite like a BMW M5 CS. Nice. So really de decent enough family car for what I need, even though it's just got the two seats in the back. I would have a I like RS6s as well because you've got the practicality of that boot. See, I, that's an, I know too many. Um, do you know what? I do one car. If I didn't do my job, mm. right, and I was an accountant, mm. the car I would have would be a Porsche 911 Carrera T. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Because you don't really, with Porsche, my opinion is you either go in at the bottom or you go in at the top. Now, top can be through RS or Turbo S. But that basic 911, especially with the Carrera T, where you get the added benefit of the torque vectory on the rear axle and some of the bits and pieces for not that much more money, but with the base engine, is all you really need for yep. the road. Wow. Now, you can choose whether to go manual or auto. 
probably if I'm using it as a daily and depending where I live, it'd probably go auto. Mm. But the manual's is a second car. If it's just, you can fit a kid in it. It's got Isofix on the front passenger seat. Oh, that's amazing. The, yeah. Honestly, it's such a good all round car. Another good all round car if you've got more of a family is an RS6. Looks great, fast enough. The new one, the performance is a bit more on it than the this is a standard car and you got all that you need. Mm. So and yeah, that make it look crazy with the, the ABT body kit. And and it does look good. So the, anyway, like a lot of car journalists like will really focus just on the driving experience. And the third, ah, oh, I feel like I should say an electric car because part of me doesn't like heat cycling an engine. Mm. So if I've got an, an <laughs> RS6, let's say, and I've got a GT3 RS, I wouldn't want to heat cycle the, the engines of those cars. <laughs> so I'd have a Tesla Model 3. Not a, cla- not, not a classic Is car? anybody expecting no. a Tesla Model 3? No. No. Just for going about, round town, stuff yeah. like that, yeah. taking the kid, like... Have uh, you like seen my the build partner. qualities on... Yeah, yeah, I know what it's like. <laughs> I, know, I, know that, I know the bad thing about it, it's not quite as bad as people think. Really? But the positives, like it's in terms of electric cars and battery management and uh, range and charging facilities, it is the best. Really? Yeah. Wow. Tesla... And I'd have a, yeah, I'd have a Tesla Model 3 for just nipping around, doing day-to-day things. No. Over a Taycan? Yeah, because at some point I like, might need to go longer distance and the Tesla will give you better battery efficiency and it would um, uh, you can use the Tesla charging network as well. And it plans, it, it's just easier. And it's less expensive because I'm buying these, right? <laughs> so you are a fan of electric cars then? Electric cars are right for the right purpose. I don't own any electric cars because I'm a motoring journalist. And so I have lots of different cars. Uh, uh, because of what I do, I have to be able to jump in a car and go a long distance. And sometimes I'm filming late. I don't want to be planning on, like, where am I going to stop and charge? So for me, it doesn't work. But if I had a normal job, mm. um, it can work for people. But I don't think, for a lot of people, they don't work. You need off-street parking for a start. Um, you need, a, uh, you don't want to be commuting too far. If you're regularly having to do random long journeys, that ain't great. Mm-hmm. And one of the things with cars is you don't, they're there to, to work for you. And you don't want to be thinking, I mean, you might have the same thing, that sometimes even putting fuel in a petrol car is a bit of an arse. Mm. Factor in, imagine if you, it takes half an hour and there's, hardly any, there's not that many petrol stations yeah <laughs> it's more used to it we used to go into a petrol station five ten minutes filling up a car yeah. off you go that's what we're used to and that's kind of what has to happen with electric cars you need that kind of like same type of five ten minute wait i don't have half an hour to wait i'm not going to wait half an hour for my car to get charged up you know and it's where, and where am i going to do it exactly where, where i'm going to do it you know there's petrol stations everywhere so you're right long distance you go you fill up off you go you know so i just don't think the infrastructure is there yet for electric cars you know for us to for a lot of people to own them, you know. We do have a charging point down here. Okay, so. well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll continue on electric cars because for some people who normally drive, who just use a car to get about and they like the, you know, they want the car to be nice inside, look all right on the outside. And most people just want a car that's quite nippy. Yeah. Electric cars are, and quiet and comfortable, electric cars are really good. Yeah, they are. If you're into cars, as someone who reviews them, one thing that my reviews feel like they miss out on now is the discussion about the the engine gearbox combination mm. because ultimately with electric cars it's pretty much this is the this is the power figure the car's going to feel like this yeah. whereas 400 horsepower from a Mercedes sorry 600 horsepower from a Mercedes V8 feels different than 600 horsepower from a Porsche flat 6 mm. twin turbo it feels and it all feels different mm. and the car has a slightly different character the noise it makes so you're removing that element mm. from it so it's not as engaging overall for an enthusiast it's not as engaging um package also the weight distribution in an internal combustion engine car can make you them feel different to drive front engine rear wheel drive front engine front wheel drive uh, mid-engine rear, rear wheel drive mid-engine all-wheel drive there's all these different combinations that change the character and the balance of a car when you're driving it quickly whereas Basically, electric cars are front, rear, 
all wheel drive, but the battery pack and the weight distribution is all low down, kind of skateboard. So effect. it's all suddenly feeling the same. So, yeah, so it's more samey and less mm. differentiation. And so the differentiation comes from the, the visual, the, so the, the visual, the quality, yeah. um, the exterior, the interior. And yeah, you haven't got the noise of the engine to think about. Mm. I've, I start getting car sick when I'm sitting as a passenger in, electric in, car. in an electric car. Because it's just, the acceleration is yeah. <laughs> just not normal, is it? Yeah. Just one thing you touched on with your three car garage. So your favourite supercar out of them is the 911 GT3 RS. So I have all supercars and you've driven some insane cars. What well, it's the one I, I I've bought. Um, some I couldn't afford. But there's just something about Porsches for me, personally. Like, they're just, I just like the design of them. I like the... That engine, that flat six, natural aspirated engine, I prefer it than the GT2 because it's the natural aspirated engine. Yeah. There's just something mad in motorsport about it that's just revs up to nine, the noise it makes when it's doing it, the way it pulls at the top end of the rev range, which you're not really going to feel on the road, but you, you can sort of in first gear, yeah. you know, but it's just something mad about it. You can definitely play with it. As I don't, There's just something about that engine. I love that engine. And in some ways I'm buying it as a, a way to buy that engine. So what's your views on the ST? So I drove the ST. I haven't driven the 3RS on the road yet. The ST was, I drove it back to back with a manual touring. And you notice the difference. It's got a lightweight really? flyway, flywheel, which my 996 has actually. And you <laughs> notice, it's got a lightweight clutch, which bites harder. The gear shift is short shift. And it's like really like bang, bang, bang. It re- you do notice it. Um, the front, it doesn't have the rear axle steering, so it doesn't tip into the corner in quite the same way, but this changed the um, the ratio on the front, so it actually feels more point on the front end. Um, I really liked it, and I was umming and ahhing whether I made the right decision. However, when I saw my 3RS, it, it's funny that I just looked at it, and I don't know, once again, whether it's the, the warsaw in me, that, I, you know, it's just like, if I could draw cars when I was a kid, I'd have drawn that car. Really? It's just... It's a childhood dream It's just car. got more aggressive as, as each iteration yeah. has, has come out, right? In, over the years. It just looks so aggressive at the moment with all the vents. And all the whatnot. vents, that wing, the, the sculpture part of the body panels, the way the, like, the door's actually carbon fibre and it's all sculpted into the wing, which honestly, I mean, it's quite impractical with the roll cage in the back. I could have had it without the roll cage, mm. but I like the look of the roll cage. Yeah. So I've got to figure out how to take it out. And- <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure we can help. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's something about them overall, the, their ability to be quite usable. Um, you could give them a beating. Like when we drag race them, we beat the crap out of them mm. and they never throw up issues or anything. Mm. Whereas other cars might get a bit funny. Ferraris, we've, had them like, oh, there's a bit of a problem here, a bit of a, well, you know, it's cutting out or something. 296s, I had some problems. Really? Wow. Yeah, I think some customers have had problems with like um, it, some engine management issues or something. Um, but yeah, so whereas Porsche just seem to just do it, take them on track, beat the crap out of them, fine. Yeah. Brakes stand up well. Nothing feels like a 911, nothing drives like a 911. So it's just then when you have a 911, you just go, yeah. This is this is very good. So yeah. you've you've bought a few new cars. What's been your worst ever experience at a, a car showroom? You don't have to say which showroom it was, but well, because I, I haven't bought that many new cars. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I bought a lot of used. Okay, let's say a used car then. Oh, uh, and look, many I've bought from private individuals. Oh really? Uh, okay, so then give us a good story about you buying a private car <sighs> well i've had a car that was clearly clocked really and how did you find out um it was in, in the days before like you could really track the mileage yeah as well as you can now but the <laughs> bits were a bit war- more worn than the clock the mileage suggested and on the actual speedometer when one wound round to the next uh, next uh, i think 10 digit i could see some where like holes in it where someone clearly put a pin in oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and pushed it back um, so that 
<laughs> <laughs> and it's also this it was the same car like when i realized it, it kind of drove a little bit wonky mm. and the um when i looked at it the the wheel was further back in the wheel arch on the one side. Oh, wow. The, 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 like, it, it had panel gaps, which were definitely well out of tolerance. Oh, my. But you don't know until you, like, do these things and you, you you learn about it. But even now, you know, I've bought some cars, which, oh, it's thrown a bit of a problem. Oh, what's this? Mm. And sometimes you just get unlucky that you buy a car and the owner may know nothing, or, or they don't even know enough about their car. Mm. And they're like, that's all fine. And then you buy it off them. And actually, you know, your car's got this problem, right? Yeah. And sometimes they might not even, I mean, those kind of owners might not even know the value of their car as well. Do you get what I'm saying? So sometimes you might go. Benefit from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then you end up buying a car for quite cheap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I've never been, I, I mean, I haven't been playing in like the, where there's big profit to be had in that. Really? Um, I only, like I said, I've got a boxer, which is probably worth about eight grand. I got it for about six, you know, it's little bits, you know, okay. but it's more that the person just I don't, wanted to sell, wanted to sell it easy. Mm. Um, okay. So you're clearly one of the largest influencers in the auto world at the moment, right? Uh, what advice do you have for us? We're trying to, you know, grow our YouTube channel, other channels. What can you? So um, I think there's a couple of key things. One is you've got to be authentic. So do what you're expert at and what feels right for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is do more, and it's probably the biggest one, do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Okay. So is that, because I, I remember watching a, a thing on uh, Mr. Beast, right? Yeah. And he's just like, he spends maybe something like 150000 or $200,000 a year just getting his thumbnails right. Yeah. So he'll try one thumbnail and then test it against another one and then see which ones wins and then keep on yeah. bettering his thumbnails like that. Are you talking about like that? That and the content itself. What videos have gone well? Do more of those. Mm. Which ones haven't done so well? Do less of those. Well. And there's another thing. Beware of the comments. Uh. Look don't necessarily follow the comments. Take on board the comments because you can learn stuff from, from them. But you get some trolls, right? You get a lot of trolls, but it's not just trolling. It can be positive comments, can um, mm. make you make bad decisions, um, not just negative ones. So I'll give you an example of where um, positive comments could have got us into trouble. Really? So we did this video. Um, it was a slightly different format than our usual review video. And people, the commenters were so positive. I love it. It's brilliant. Genius. Really creative. Wow. And I was looking at it. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. I'm banging. This is going to take off. Then I looked. Eventually, you know, a few days later, you get your audience engagement. It did poor. Really? Like properly, like uh, when I did this segment, which I thought was brilliant and everyone said was brilliant. Boom. Wow. Silent and job. Look at your graphs. The graph uh, are, are the people that matter because that's the vast majority of people we'll do a video with a million views and you'll get three thousand comments maybe ten thousand comments mm. what proportion is that of a million um well one we're both accountants one percent, <laughs> one, one percent if it's ten thousand right yeah over a million and that's like so i reckon it's probably like less than that's 0.3 percent three point three or point four percent of the people mm. would you and, and it, it doesn't always add up mm. Like I was with the bad comments that you could be put off, but what does your graph say? How's the video going? So when you say graph, so as in like, what at what retention. point do people drop off? It's What's looking the average at, view time? That's it. You're looking at, you watch the, you can see, can't you, where people are in the video, where they're dropping out mm. and the audience retention. Look at that mm. because ultimately YouTube, what's it going to do? It's going to serve content that makes it the most money. Yeah. And how do you make YouTube money? You make YouTube money by keeping people in the engaged. platform. Yeah. You keep them engaged. Not just engaged with your stuff, more. but with other people's stuff as well. So if you can engage people, um, you will make YouTube more money and it will serve you more because it's a business and that's what it's so designed to do. engaged with other people's stuff. What do you mean by that? Then? So w what's the likelihood that someone watches some of your stuff and then they're going to just stay in the YouTube platform and it doesn't just have to be with ah, your content. YouTube spiraling. It. Yeah. Just how does your content perform that? That's harder to manage. But basically, you just look at which bit of our videos did well. Mm. 
watch time is really important. Okay. And um, yeah, just a quick one about comments that are good. When we, I first started doing the reviews, I did a segment called um, Five Good Things About This Car. Mm. And someone wrote and said, you should probably do five bad things as well. Because five good things seem a bit biased. Mm. And he was right. Wow. And so we started doing five bad things as well. And it was only after the, it was like the second video that we learned that on. That uh, someone was really helpful and you get an idea. So can you, you can use it to get your yeah. idea for your so next video. So I look at a lot segment. of comments. Yeah. And I'm so used to, oh, Matt's an idiot. Meh, you know, because <laughs> you know what? I can be an idiot. Yeah. And so someone's opinion, yes, I am. And sometimes you have people that are negative and they they show up all the time. So some people watch you because they don't like you. But that's good. It's a view, right? But I just don't understand those people. It's like, what went wrong? But sometimes them, people like, watch stuff like, Pier, might watch something like Piers Morgan because yeah. they're like, what an idiot. Yeah. But it's still a viewer. Uh, and it's still, it's still a fan. You can yeah. still monetize them. Still watch them. Yes, when so. I was doing columns for newspapers, I was told... What you want to do, you either want to take people along with you, they really agree with you, or you want to make them really disagree with you. And they'll look at your content, find out what this idiot has said next. Yeah. What you don't want to do is make them indifferent to indifferent, you. Indifferent, yeah. They won't come back. They won't. Just like, oh. All right. So there you go. We need to do some controversial stuff which some people agree with and some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Any suggestions? What what would you do? What would you oh. suggest? Give us give us one idea then. Well, I I would what I would do is look through all the content that you've done yeah. uh, and see where you've you've noticed like a, a noticeably more um, more views than your average. Okay. So looking at your videos that are ranked, they're ranking one to ten. Look at your ones, twos, and threes. Okay. What is that about? What is that? Who's in that video? What is the content about? Perfect. What's going on in that video? What did we do? Why do we think that has done what it's done? And do more of that. Yeah. And do less of the eight, nines, and tens. I already know one video that would have done really well with the OnlyFans. Yeah. So we might need to get some more models in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you've got to wonder whether that's sustainable. Yeah, it's not. But it, but it's doing. But maybe the ethos behind it that you knew that there was some kind of wider appeal there. Mm. So, what other things can you do with a wider appeal? There's, there's like lessons to be learned from that type of content. Yeah, I mean, I don't get it right. I, I get it right enough of the time. Mm. <laughs> oh well, you've still obviously got it right quite yeah. a lot. Yeah, but still get it quite wrong. Mm. So, uh, Matt, what's what's next for Matt Watson? So. Obviously, I've got my GT3 RS. I'm going to reveal it, the spec that I've gone for. Can't wait to show everybody who, who's like watched the last video. So that's really exciting. Um, there's some other things in the pipeline which I obviously can't talk about. Um, car wow wise we've got some really, really cool content coming up. It's a bit like with Red Bull, the way we've had like big, famous organisations contact us to do certain things. We've got some more of that in the pipeline. So cool. That's so it's, it's pretty exciting. Lots to do, lots to film, and lots to share. Perfect. Very exciting. More to that. Well, we've all enjoyed having you down here today. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. No, and, thank you very much. And uh, look, uh, don't become a stranger. Come down whenever you are around the area and see what kind of stock that we got in. And maybe we'll supply some more cars for some of your drag races in the future. Do you want to drag race the Enzo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About that. <laughs> Maybe, you never know. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you do, please like, share and subscribe. Until the next time, see you later. <laughs>